All right, coming to a case. This is where we put all our lectures and theory and knowledge to the test in the real world. So this is a particular uh, case of a single central incisor. As many of you may uh, already know, single central incisors are a little bit of a challenge because managing the two centrals are uh, very, very difficult. And in these cases, you'll have to go for a highly customized layered restoration rather than um, rather than a monolithic restoration. Uh, if you're going to uh, restore this with an all ceramic material like Emacs, you will probably find it easier than if you're going to do it with zirconia because zirconia tends to look a little bit too bright and it uh, looks a little bit more opaque uh, and artificial as compared to uh, an all ceramic restoration. So we are going to look at all the things that we've discussed in the lectures. We're going to look at the material science, the impression techniques, the tooth preparation, the shade selection, stump shade, as well as the final shade, isolation, bonding, cementation. So let's go ahead and have a look. Okay. So this is our initial presentation, endodontically treated single central incisor. Uh, there has been a composite veneering done about uh, seven, eight years ago. And of course, it is discolored. Now, this discoloration is probably not only the composite that is discolored. Of course, there are some superficial stains, but more than that, I think there is or uh, there we would assume at this stage that there is also some discoloration due to the non vital nature of the uh, substrate tooth. Now, the other thing to notice is that uh, there is a little bit of an overlap, which means that there is limited amount of space that is available for this central incisor. The reason why this is so important is because the central incisors is the starting of the smile and any kind of uh, deviations from the normal between the left and right in the symmetry is very much visible and that's something that we have to try and take care of as much as possible. Believe me, uh, single centrals are one of the most difficult cases. In fact, so much so that sometimes uh, uh, some of the clinicians who uh, are doing conservative uh, veneer dentistry, they will sometimes do a veneer on the adjacent tooth just, just to match uh, uh, to match the two centrals. Now, in this particular case, I have not done a veneer on the other central, but you can imagine if that was something uh, we did, I would. Uh, I mean, it's a good treatment option also because not only are we going to make it easier for the two central incisors to match in terms of color, but we'll also be able to divide this space equally between the two lateral incisors. So we'll be able to get symmetry in not only in color, but also shape, size and texture. Anyway, what we've done here is just one central, which is a bigger challenge. So let's go and see how we've done it. So um, you have to remember that you have to protect not only the adjacent teeth when you're doing tooth preparation, but you also have to protect the gingiva. So let's see how I've done that. Now, first I've done some depth cuts into the composite material uh, so that I can provide enough space for my technician to give me this kind of an incisal translucent halo on this side. So this is representing that amount of space. Now, if you do this without depth cutting burrs, it's also okay, but you'll have less control. So depth burrs, one millimeter, approximately 1, 1 to 1.2 1 millimeters is what I've given here and another 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters will probably go when we do the final preparation and the finishing. So you have to protect first the adjacent teeth. Now because in this particular case there is an overlapping, whenever there is an overlapping of two teeth, the chances of you nicking the adjacent tooth becomes that much higher. So one of the easiest ways to prevent nicking of the adjacent teeth is to just take a regular matrix band or metal matrix band and apply it interproximally just the way I've done it. Now, sometimes if the contact point is very tight, especially in overlapping teeth, there's a long, broad contact point between the two teeth. You may want to um, uh, uh, lighten the contact point with your burr going close to the contact point and lightening it, the pressure. Or you can ap apply two wedges and create some, some uh, uh, temporary separation between the teeth so that you can now place this matrix band into the teeth. So this photograph is quite self-explanatory. So this is how we protect. This is how we protect the adjacent teeth. And this is how we protect 
तो चिंजाएगा रिमेंबर रिट्रैक्शन इज नॉट ओनली फॉर इंप्रेशन यू कैन यूज एन अन इम्प्रेग्नेटेड कॉर्ड टू रिट्रैक्ट जिंजाइवा वाइल टूथ प्रिपरेशन वाई अन अन इम्प्रेग्नेटेड कॉर्ड बिकॉज वेन यू आर डूइंग टूथ प्रिपरेशन यू आर कीपिंग द रिट्रैक्शन कॉर्ड इन साइड द सर्कस फॉर अ सिग्निफिकेंट अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम नॉर्मली द रिकमेंडेड अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम फॉर फॉर जिंजाइवल रिट्रैक्शन इज फाइव टू सेवन मिनट्स नाउ ऑब्वियसली इफ यू गोइंग टू डू टूथ प्रिपरेशन uh with the retraction cord you are going to have uh, uh the time that is going to be there is going to be much more so you have to be careful and don't use uh, chemicals which will uh, cause a permanent damage to the gingiva vis a vis the necrosis of the gingiva okay so uh, you know you tend to get a significant vertical retraction in the anterior teeth uh, even with a very thin cord okay so uh, what does that mean it means that the, when you are doing a gingival retraction the gingiva moves suppose this is the tooth and this is the gingiva the gingiva when you retract the gingiva the gingiva not only moves horizontally out but it also moves vertically down this vertical movement happens significantly more in anterior teeth whereas in posterior teeth there is more amount of horizontal uh, gingival movement or retraction so in the anterior region when there is a vert when when you have a significant amount of vertical retraction even with a very thin retraction cord you can end up looking at uh, a subgingival margin as if as if it is a supragingival margin while you are doing the tooth preparation so this is very very advantageous for us because now subgingival margins have become supragingival obviously in this case we are opting for a subgingival margin because as you can see the substrate tooth is quite discolored and we are going to be changing the color of the tooth so if we if the margin of the natural tooth and the ceramic is visible then you will have an aesthetic failure especially if the patient has a high smile line so i definitely want to tuck the margin under the gingiva so that it looks like a natural tooth and we are able to change the color and it uh, of course looks very very uh, uh, natural so now this is the uh, retraction now we are using a thicker cord retraction not the thin cord so this is a thinner cord for the tooth preparation but now we are using a thicker cord now you can either go for a one step retraction or you can go uh, sorry one uh, cord retraction or a double cord retraction here i have chosen to go for a single cord retraction because i think we are getting enough retraction with this kind of cord but we are using a thicker cord now this cord uh is now used for the before making the impression uh how do we do retraction we start retraction from the proximal okay because why do we start from the proximal because uh, because the circular depth in the interproximal region is much more than it is on the facial or the lingual aspect in fact the facial aspect is the least so it is much much easier to start the retraction where the circular de circular depth is maximum okay so now this is the photograph that represents the final prep with the larger size cord in place so you can see now what you need to see in this photograph is that the gingiva is away from the uh, the margins of the restoration this is how you know you have got adequate retraction okay and now this is the impression that you get this is a single step putty wash uh, impression and here how do you read an impression how do you know it's a good impression when you can see the rough outer surface which represents the unprepared tooth structure i mentioned this in detail uh, in the impressions uh, lecture if you have not if you don't understand this point i need you to go and um, check it out okay and so this is the unprepared tooth structure this little fin over here and underneath that you have the thick margin that is visible clearly in recorded in the light body the other thing i want you to notice in this impression is see can you imagine can you see even the stippling has been picked up by the light body this is showing you how much of moisture control uh, i have uh, uh, you know uh, got uh, during the impression procedure so you can this is the kind of dry impression that you need because unfortunately all the impression materials that we are using today are still somewhat uh, you know hydrophobic which means that it runs away from water and moisture so you need a very very dry surface 
almost as much as uh, suppose if you're doing a composite restoration so we need a very dry field to make a good impression okay next very important uh, this is a discolored tooth anyway if any time you are using a translucent material for your tooth uh, for your uh, rest if, if your uh, final material of choice is a translucent material like we are using emacs you have to provide the stump shade because everything underneath is going to be uh, 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 having an effect on the final look of the restoration so the stump shade is uh, taken by something called as a nd guide or a natural uh, dye uh, shade guide and this is going to provide my technician enough information to um, give me a restoration which is not only uh, which is not only the correct shade in terms of the adjacent tooth but it's the correct shade in terms of what is underneath all of these things have been discussed in detail in the lectures check out the shade selection lecture all right so now we are also taking now we are taking the shade as compared to the adjacent tooth what is the final shade of the restoration that i want so this is the stump shade this is the final shade that i want so when you're looking at the emacs ingots the emacs ingots is is uh, selected based on the restoration shade determination all right so now this is the model that comes from the impression that uh, my technician pours again you do not have to pour your impression you are never going to be as good as your technician in pouring the impression and uh, you know when you look at the model you should read your models when they come back from the lab you should read them then you will learn a lot about your mistakes so in this model of course you can really appreciate the two the the, the two phase reduction or the two uh, you know two different uh, plane two plane reduction of the central incisor you can appreciate that clearly in this photograph but what else you can notice is that in some areas of course here the retraction is very good the gingiva is away from the margin but in this area my technician is going to find it a little bit difficult to do the die ditching and die cutting but why because the gingiva is um, too close to the edge of the margin so i could have gotten more i should have gotten more retraction at least in the mesial interproximal region so you learn from your mistakes and this is the die preparation that my technician has done he's obviously still done a fantastic job but i'm if i'm nitpicking i'm trying to find my faults so this is the photograph of the die that is prepared on which the wax up is going to be done and on which the restoration is going to be made so here is the restoration that has been fabricated looking uh, absolutely nice you can see the translucent nature of your uh, emacs restoration you can see the tooth preparation underneath right obviously uh, the tooth preparation is brown in color i mean it, it is the color of the stone so that is not going to look like this in the patient's mouth but just to show you how um, how it's looking on the model absolutely fabulous restorations uh, you know provided by none other than mohit suryavanshi so if you have a good ceramicist um you cannot do indirect dentistry unless and until you have complete confidence in your uh, lab all right now this is something that i keep talking to you all about whenever the restoration comes back from the lab we just get excited that wow today our restoration today our case is complete and we are going to get paid but that is not how i look at it and that's not how you should be looking at it you should always consider that when the restoration has come back from the lab that is your trial appointment okay so this is called an aesthetic trial even though i have not done a bisc trial or a coping trial i have simply gone straight ahead for the aesthetic trial which means the restoration comes back to you with the final glaze and uh, staining okay so obviously this is a single central incisor case i don't expect to uh, i don't i mean of course if i'll get lucky on day 1 it's amazing the patient likes it i love it and we and we bond it but seldom that is the case and i will send this work back because i feel obviously you can tell there is a significant amount of staining which is not looking good and we need to send this back okay it's pretty self evident so it comes back and we do again a trial this is called a dry trial where there is nothing really um, underneath it is just we're just checking the fitting of the crown on the 
uh, abutment. So this is a dry trial. There is no jelly. There is no trial paste. Nothing. It is just the crown that is going inside, and we are checking for the proximal fit. That means we are checking for the contact points, and also we are checking for the fit of the crown on the abutment teeth. Okay. So don't use any gel. Dry the tooth. Don't have any saliva because even any amount of saliva around this area is going to impede your visibility, and you're not able. You're not going to be able to see how well. Uh, or not does this restoration fit so coming to the bonding part obviously i'm using a rubber dam here uh, bonding a single crown doesn't always need, need a rubber dam so if you're going to be following all the other steps minus the rubber dam uh, that's also absolutely fine and uh, that's also absolutely correct uh, one thing that you can do is that you can use a, um, a retraction cord it makes life a lot easier and cleanup becomes a lot easier. So obviously, uh, if you attended my lecture on um, uh, cements and cementation, you will remember that I am only uh, going to use resin cements for glass restoration because glass restorations are further strengthened by the, com uh, by the resin cements that have very high compressive strength as compared to GIC or anything else. Okay, so this is the isolation and uh, drying. Now, once you put the rubber dam, you also need to do another trial so that after the rubber dam has been placed, the clamps are in place, the crown is seating to its final place. If you're not using rubber dam, then to the, the trial at this point obviously is not needed. Okay, so this is the final trial. And now this is important. Before you bond, before you do, you do any kind of cementation or use, uh, use any kind of resin cements, it is very important to remove plaque. Please remember, self-adhesive resin cements or any kind of resin cements, they are not going to uh, bond to the natural tooth structure in any way or form if there is plaque on the tooth. Even if you are not using plaque disclosing agents as I have used here, please use a fluoride free pumice paste to clean and blast away to clean away all the uh, to clean away all the uh, plaque now why fluoride free because fluoride will interfere in the bonding process of in your uh, next step okay how however what i have used is which is another uh, a, a better version than even doing a fluoride free pumice paste i am using uh, aqua care so I'm using aqua care I'm using 29 micron aluminium oxide and I am blasting it away so even before I etch the tooth the tooth looks etched right you can see how clean and it's got a matte appearance so this is how clean it looks and if you apply plaque disclosing agent again you will see that this surface is absolutely clean so if you are not using sandblasting you can just use a fluoride free pumice paste but please make sure that your pumice paste is in fact fluoride free okay so not only do you have to clean the tooth but you also have to clean the restoration now for the restoration i'm again blasting it with my sand blaster if you do not have this then you can simply clean it with alcohol uh, like uh, you know when you have done the trial in the patient's mouth uh, there's saliva, there's salivary proteins. Alcohol is an organic solvent. It's going to help to clean all that surface away. Okay, I'm not going to use hydrofluoric acid or silane coupling agent because I'm using a self-adhesive resin cement and there is enough retention on the tooth preparation, enough amount of uh, uh, conventional retention. I do not need any kind of added retention through the full bonding protocol. Of course, you can do it if you like, but in my case, I have not done that. I've just had both clean surfaces and I'm using self-adhesive resin cement, something like Speed Sem by Ivoclar Vivadent. It's a self-adhesive resin cement. You can see um, that I have placed it. And then very important cleanup. Please remember resin cement is a double-edged sword. It is, it's an excellent cement, it bonds, it provides uh, very good aesthetics it uh, all those things are amazing and has high compressive strength but it is very very important to do a proper cleanup because resin cement even slight amounts of it left in the subgingival areas is going to cause massive irritation and it's going to be very difficult to clean once it completely sets so 
this is something that you need to practice and this is something that I know for a fact that many of you are going to get it wrong uh, uh, when you're going to start working with Asian cement specifically even more delicate are posterior areas where contact points are tighter uh, access is more difficult and therefore cleanup is more difficult but this is something uh, you need to practice and you need to see how other people do it everybody has their own ways of cleaning up some people do a tack cure and then clean some people do without tack cure and they clean first uh, flossing is obviously extremely important in this case okay and then finally even after you have taken all precautions you will and you should now take a 12 number blade and scrape scrape all the excesses in cement that may have set and that you were not able to remove when it has not set the other problem of resin cement it is such an aesthetic material that one cannot even see it once it sets it looks it just merges with with the ceramic or the natural tooth right so you can't see it so what do you do use a 12 number bb blade and you scrape you will be able to feel it but you cannot see it so this is an extremely important step whether it's a veneer or a crown anytime you're using resin cement this is an extremely important step okay and if you've not uh, anesthetized the patient this step can be very painful so a little bit of sur uh, surface anesthesia or at least some kind of infiltration around the papillary region i would recommend for your uh, bonding procedures as well okay so this is the final post-op this is actually a two weeks post-op after gingiva has healed because obviously with sub gingival margins there will be some amount of damage to the gingiva on the day of cementation and on the day of cleaning so the final result not too bad but obviously there is still some difference between the two teeth but as i can tell as as you know central incisors are a very 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 big challenge for our technicians so we have to provide as much information as possible for our technician to do a great job so this is the final you can see the quality of the gingiva the gingival healing I always keep saying this, it's an un, un, unappreciated, underappreciated fact that the soft tissue response around all ceramic materials is just fabulous. And Jinjaiva's, Jinjaiva loves soft tissue. I mean, Jinjaiva, soft tissue loves Emacs. And this is your final restoration. Another photograph. You can see the translucency. You can see a more chromatic area happening here. And of course, there is a slight difference in size as well, but now we're just nitpicking, okay? So that's it for this case. I'm going to see you in the next presentation. Cheers.